The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. At the very top of the political ladder in most established democratic nations, women find the glass ceiling still very much intact. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Tonight, continuing our look back at people who've changed the conversation, we'll hear again from Julia Gillard, the first woman to be Prime Minister of Australia. Julia Gillard was Australia's Prime Minister from 2010 to 2013. She replaced sitting Prime Minister Kevin Rudd as Labour Party leader and went on to narrowly win a minority parliament two months later. In 2012, her speech to parliament calling out the opposition for sexism went viral. It's since been dubbed the misogyny speech and in 2020 was voted as the most unforgettable moment in Australian TV history. Despite that speech, which specifically accused then-opposition leader Tony Abbott of sexism, he went on to win the 2013 election and take over as Prime Minister of Australia. This interview first aired on February 6, 2017. In October of that year, the Me Too movement exploded, first on social media and then into the wider world. As of this year, Julia Gillard was continuing her work as chair of the Global Partnership for Education. Here's that conversation from 2017. First elected to the Australian House of Representatives in 1998 under the Labour Party banner, Julia Gillard rose steadily through the opposition ranks, becoming the first woman Deputy Prime Minister of Australia, and in 2010, taking the reins as the first female Prime Minister of the country. She served three years in that role, and during her tenure delivered what's come to be known as the misogyny speech, a takedown in Parliament that went viral, cheered by women in her own country and far beyond. Julia Gillard is now chair of the Global Partnership for Education, and we're pleased to welcome her here to our studios in the capital city of the province of Ontario. Lovely to meet you. Thank you very much. Great to be here. I have to give you congratulations. You're about to get the equivalent of the Order of Canada, I gather. <laughs> Companion of the Order of Australia. Yes, I am. That's so a nice thing. It's a lovely thing. We had our National Day, Australia Day, at the end of January, and the awards are announced on that day. Uh, so I was delighted to be uh, honoured by receiving a Companion of the Order of Australia. I was on my way to Malawi pursuing work for the Global Partnership. Mm for education so I didn't get to have an Aussie barbecue or anything like that to celebrate I'll now, do that some other time. I wondered when you were going to drop a few of those cliches <laughs> in the thing but okay stereotypes I guess. Uh, we are going to get to that what you're doing on the global partnership but I want to start with the speech that if you don't mind my putting it this way made you world famous and that was the year 2012 you're in Parliament it was directed at the opposition leader Tony Abbott uh, who would, of course, later come to serve as Prime Minister of your country as well, and it went something like this. Roll it. I say to the Leader of the Opposition, I will not be lectured about sexism and misogyny by this man. I will not. And the Government Order. will not be lectured about sexism Order. and misogyny by this man. Not now, not ever. The Leader of the Opposition says that people who hold sexist views and who are misogynists are not appropriate for high office. Well, I hope the Leader of the Opposition has got a piece of paper and he is writing out his resignation. Because if he wants to know what misogyny looks like in modern Australia, he doesn't need a motion in the House of Representatives. He needs a mirror. I was offended when the Leader of the Opposition went outside in the front of Parliament and stood next to a sign that said, Ditch the Witch. I was offended when the Leader of the Opposition stood next to a sign that described me as a man's bitch. I was offended by those things. Misogyny, sexism, every day from this Leader of the Opposition. Why did you feel the need to give that speech? <laughs> Oh, well, I think some of the content itself has probably told your viewers why I needed to give that speech. Uh, when I became Prime Minister of Australia, I thought, you know, the maximum reaction to me being the first woman, positive and negative, would be in the early days of me being Prime Minister. So there would be a bit of a go-girl reaction. But there also might be some people who said, oh, I'm a bit uncomfortable about this. And then I thought it would sort of, you know, work its way out of the system and I'd just be treated as 
any other Prime Minister. What I actually found was the longer I was Prime Minister, the more it grew, the sexism and misogyny, that it actually became the kind of go-to weapon during hard political debates, the sexist quip. Uh, and the Leader of the Opposition had involved himself in that, and I think you saw in that speech a sense of mounting frustration uh, that I wasn't being judged as Prime Minister on how well I was doing the job, but being judged on my gender. How much of that was spontaneity? Mm. Uh, it was spontaneity. It was, eh? it was. I knew going to Parliament that day that we were going to have a debate about sexism because the Speaker of the House of Representatives had been discovered as issuing very sexist tweets. Uh, so I knew that, um, sorry, not tweets, text messages. So I knew that that was going to be the debate of the day. So I had my office get together some of uh, Tony Abbott's uh, key sexist quotes. I had those with me. Uh, but apart from that, it was off the cuff. He's got a bit of a smirk on his face while he's listening to you, which I presume you noticed as you were delivering your speech. How did that have an impact on the emotion with which you made that speech? Well, he started with a bit of a smirk. I think that's true, and I did see that. But by the end of the speech, he was uh, dropping his head, and at one point he looked at his watch. And so I knew uh, that the speech was having force in the House of Representatives. Uh, in the Australian Parliament, you are actually quite close to the opposition. And so when I started that speech, they had their heads up. They were yelling, interjecting. By the time I was finishing it, they'd all dropped their heads. They were fiddling with their phones. They they were whispering to each other. So I knew that it had had a big impact in the House of Representatives. What, what was your inference about, I mean, clearly if, they're, if their heads are down and they're, they can't make eye contact, they're presumably feeling pretty sheepish about the kind of information you were bringing them. Is that what you took from it? I think, uh, I don't know whether sheepish is right. I think... Ashamed? Uh, ash oh, I doubt ashamed. Uh, I suspect they were thinking to themselves that this tactic had backfired and that a debate they thought they could win, uh, they were mm. actually very much losing. How about beyond the House? In the population of Australia, generally speaking, what do you think the impact of the speech was? Well, I had no sense, you know, in the Parliament on that day that there was this, you know, ripple effect in the chamber beyond uh, and I walk back to my office you know you finish a parliamentary debate you listen to other speakers a votes held walk back to my office and already uh, the staff were saying the phones are going nuts we've got emails streaming in you know everybody is talking about this and Good so or was, bad? Uh, mixed mm -hmm. uh, mixed I was quite taken aback how um, you know profound the reaction was uh, and now to this day when I travel overseas or I'm walking down a street in Australia, people will cross the road to come over and talk to me about that speech. So I think it did end up uh, saying something, particularly to women who had found themselves in a situation where they were treated in a sexist way and they bit their lip or they'd come up with the world's best response at 3am the next morning um, and thought, why didn't I say that then? Um, that speech came to mean something for them. The Daily Telegraph has called it, quote, among the most famous political oratories of all time. And it has also been reported that young girls memorize that speech and shout it in the streets. Did you have any idea that you would be having that kind of impact as you were in the midst of it? None, none whatsoever. And uh, the speech has been put to music. <laughs> all sorts of uh, all sorts of interesting things have happened. Uh, no, no sense at all um, of the power of it beyond the chamber and the power of it over time. Well, perhaps it struck such a serious chord because, and we'll put this information up here, last October, the Interparliamentary Union released a report looking at sexism that female parliamentarians face. They spoke to 55 female politicians from 39 different countries. Here we go, Sheldon, let's put these up. More than 80% of respondents said they were affected by psychological violence during their parliamentary term. More than 65% said they had faced humiliating sexual or sexist remarks. More than 40% said they had experienced, quote, extremely humiliating or sexually charged images of themselves spread through social media. One European parliamentarian reported receiving more than 500 threats of rape on Twitter over a four-day period. More than 44% said they received threats of death, rape, beatings, or abductions. How much of any of that did you have to deal with during your political career? Uh, well, kind of all of it. Certainly on my social media feeds, there would be, you know, not 
every day, but regularly. Um, threats of violence, threats of rape, uh, shocking uh, sexist, uh, misogynist statements. And I think that is something that women politicians live with. Uh, I think one of the things that social media has done is it's sort of taken the cork out of the bottle, things that people might have thought but been too inhibited to say. Uh, with the anonymity of mm. social media, they think that they can just, you know, put it out there. Now, that's a bad thing in the sense that, you know, the, the violence and the imagery is there, but maybe it's forcing us to confront the fact that those views are held about women leaders, and I'd rather openly debate it and resolve it and get to a stage that women are treated equally as political leaders than have it sort of lurking in the background unnamed. Is that why you have not shut down your Twitter account? No, I have a Twitter account, and, you know, mostly uh, people are generous and engaged, but certainly there are these aspects for women. And I think, you know, there's plenty of research now about the way in which women's leadership is received by people in the community. Mm -hmm. And I think if we're frank, we all have some sexist stereotypes whispering at the back of our brains. And we, you know, those stereotypes whisper to us that a woman who is, you know, commanding and controlling a leader, we easily conclude, look, she can't be very nurturing. She can't be very empathetic. She's probably not very likeable. Uh, and once people conclude those sorts of things, then it seems to be easier to lash out. Mm. And I think, you know, in the US presidential campaign, we saw a lot of this playing out. The uh, image that Hillary Clinton had to overcome was an image that she wasn't likeable. Well, why did people have that image? I think Hillary Clinton's an eminently likeable person. I think a lot of it's got to do with gender. Is this the new normal? Well, I hope... In an era of Trump, I have to add. Well, I hope it's... Um, a contemporary stage where uh, we're having the debate we need to have to get to a world where female leaders are truly treated equally and people don't focus on their appearance, don't focus on their family structures, uh, don't engage in this sort of gender stereotyping and just judge them uh, well or badly based on how they do their job as a politician, hmm. whether they make good decisions or bad decisions. I, I guess it's been almost 25 years since Canada got its first and still only female uh, prime minister. Uh, no social media back then, so that was one thing Kim Campbell didn't have to worry about. Today, uh, we've got Angela Merkel, of course, in Germany. We've got Theresa May in the United Kingdom, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf in Liberia, Michelle Bachelet in Chile. Do female leaders today have it, well, I don't know, a little easier than you insofar as you're kind of the first very high profile female head of government kind of when social media began to explode. So do you have it tougher than these leaders do today? Oh, I wouldn't say tougher. And I think a lot depends on, you know, context. I mean, I was involved in some incredibly hard debates about things like putting a price on carbon and combating climate change. And the, you know, sexist jibes became part of that hard political debate. So uh, I think the circumstances in which you're pursuing your leadership matter. But there are some things that are common for all female leaders. Um, you know, this focus on appearance this uh, sense that they're probably pretty hard-boiled, not very likeable, that we need to work on right around the world uh, to get a more equal future. Hmm. Here in the province of Ontario, we have Kathleen Wynne as the Premier, who is the first female Premier in Ontario history. That's going back nearly 150 years. Uh, she's also openly gay, and I can tell you, as a guy who spends too much time professionally uh, on social media, some of the filth out there and some of the like extraordinarily obscene language I see used about her is really uh, beyond the pale. Mm. But the question is now, what do we do about that? You can't shut Twitter down. You can't shut Facebook down. So what do we do? Well, I think uh, there's increasingly movements for change. Um, so to, to really deal with the problem, firstly, you've got to shine a light on it. And discussions like this are shining the light that we need to have. And then you need really activism to change attitudes. I was very impressed when I was recently in the United Kingdom that there's this movement uh, to reclaim the internet, uh, mirroring itself on the Reclaim the Night movement. You would recall the time when, uh, you know, the, the advice that police officers 
officers would give to women because sexual assaults were happening was don't go out at night or if you are going out at night, make sure you're accompanied by a man. And women said, well, hang on, you know, should we be the ones who have to change our behaviour uh, because men are assaulting women or should we stop men assaulting women? Let's reclaim the night. And now women are saying, let's reclaim the internet. Let's try and make this a safer space for women. Uh, and I think that kind of campaigning and activism ultimately does make a difference. Is it even possible, though? Oh, look, I'm an optimist, you know, and everything about my life reinforces that optimism. You know, I went to a great government school uh, when I was a teenager, uh, and, you know, I'm very thankful for that education. Uh, but even when I was at school, you know, the, the boys were separated from the girls, and the boys were taught uh, woodwork, metalwork and electronics, while we were taught uh, cu cooking, sewing and my personal favourite, laundry, uh, because <laughs> we were being prepared to be housewives. I mean, that happened in my lifetime. And against that backdrop, I became Australia's first female Prime Minister. And if you can live through that much change, then the rest has got to be possible. Well, it's also possible that you could come to an entirely different conclusion, which is the price that women have to pay to run for public office is too high, and therefore they shouldn't do it. Oh, I'd never, You're not going there. Uh, I'm not, I'd never agree with that. And uh, I do say to young women, some of whom have watched my journey in politics and it's made them uh, think, you know, is it worth it? Uh, I say if you've got the passion and there are things that you want to change, then absolutely go for it. And if I, you know, today had to go through exactly the same experiences, you know, the same three years, day by day with the same things happening, would I do it again? Yes, absolutely. You would. Absolutely, because the uh, ability that it gives you to change and shape your nation, to do things that you really believe in, is unparalleled. That's what politics offers. Do you warn these young women, young girls as well, that if they go into public life, they had better put a flak jacket on because the amount of blowback you're going to get just for being a woman in politics is going to be hugely intense? I certainly counsel them to make sure that they develop a very strong sense of self. You can't afford uh, to look at a nice tweet and say, gee, I feel good about myself, and then look at a dreadful one and go, oh, I'm just devastated now. You can't put yourself on that emotional roller coaster. You've got to have a sense of who you are. And the reality is, you know, I was the same Julia Gillard on days I was getting wonderful newspaper headlines as on days I was getting dreadful uh, newspaper headlines, same mix of strengths and weaknesses. So you've got to understand that and have a little bit of, you know, protective padding between mm. you and this roller coaster world. Gotcha. Let's uh, take a look at some of the trends that are happening around the world right now. And to that end, we see in what were liberal democratic countries rise, uh, well, the rise of Trumpism, the rise of nativism, um, populism. What do you think is happening out there now? I think that there's been uh, so much change and uh, much of it has been so difficult for people that they are, you know, kind of, to use that old saying, um, their thought about the world is, you know, can we just stop this now? Stop the world, I want to get off, I you know? I just, point, wanna, yes. I just want to rest from it for a while. Can someone just push it away for a while? Uh, and I think some of the politics around uh, nativism and anti-change is to try and pretend to people that there's a way you can stop the world and give everybody a rest. The reality is you can't. Uh, change is going to be here, it's going to be reshaping things and the best we can do is strengthen people's resilience and adaptability in the face mm. of that change. You've already told us you stumped for Hillary Clinton in the last US presidential election and you've also told us you're an optimist. Yes. Okay. Trump won. Mm. You still optimistic about the future of the West and America? Oh, look, I am over time. I would note that, of course, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote, but no, she's not President of the United States, and so a decision has been made. I would have preferred to see President Clinton and to see that glass ceiling shattered. Uh, but this is the world we live in and the world in which we do uh, have to uh, make sure that we're advocating for good values, and those values are about uh, global engagement and looking outwards. Um, I'm a fiercely proud, patriotic Australian 
Australian, I'm always going to be that, uh, but I'm smart enough to know uh, that what happens beyond Australia's uh, boundaries, borders, matters to what happens within our country. So we've got to look outwards and we've got to be engaged with the rest of the world. How would you characterise Mr Trump's presidency so far? Uh, well, I don't uh, want to get involved too much uh, in uh, reflections on Mr Trump and relations with Australia, but uh, what I would say is Australia and the US are good friends and will continue to be good friends, uh, and I suspect uh, President Trump and his team are learning some things day by day. You are still capable of wonderfully politic answers. Well done. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Thank you. I think you meant that as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. Uh, four years now since you've been out of office. What do you miss? Oh, look, I miss a, a great deal. I mean, I miss having the uh, ability to change things, to look at a problem, to think about what policy would make a difference and then put it into action. So I do miss that. I hear uh, that from so many politicians when yeah, they're out. They yeah. say that the, the feeling of picking up the paper, seeing a problem and thinking, dang, I can't do anything about that. Yes, it is frustrating yeah. when you have had those levers of power in mm -hmm. your hand. Um, I miss the sense of teamwork with the best of my colleagues because uh, you're, you know, it's so intense an experience, so hard an experience. The bonds you forge with the best of your colleagues are, yeah. you know, great ones. And so I miss that sort of intensity of teamwork. Uh, but I don't miss the relentlessness of it. I mean, it is just unrelieved. And I don't miss the sort of media intrusions into private life questions, which I used to face. Hmm. Former presidents or prime ministers basically, I think, have their pick of the litter of what issues they want to champion after their political careers are over. So you could have picked anything and you've decided education in developing countries is going to be your thing. Why did you land on that? Well, education was always my thing. The reason I first got involved in anything that looked like politics was I got to go to university and there were some big government cutbacks to universities from a conservative government and I got involved in student unionism to say, look, these cutbacks are wrong and we should have the university doors open to people from all walks of life and people like me. I mean, my father was a nurse, my mother was a cook in an aged care facility. I didn't come from a privileged background. I got to go to university. So why can't we keep the doors open to everyone? And it's really that that took me through my political journey, a belief in opportunity and education as an agent of change. So it made sense in this post-active politics bit of my life uh, to do what I could to make a difference to those most likely in the world to miss out on the benefits of a school education. So what does the Global Partnership do? What the Global Partnership does is we work with great donor nations, of which Canada is one, so thank you very much, uh, and we pull that funding and it goes to assist 65 developing countries around the world, the lowest income countries. Uh, as I said, I was just in Malawi. This is a place where uh, class sizes are routinely 100. Uh, many students still learn under trees because there aren't enough classrooms. And in a place like that, we mobilise funding and technical expertise to build more classrooms, to train more teachers, to financially support the poorest kids to get to go to school. I, I suspect the answer to this question is obvious, but let's go here anyway. What's the difference in outcome between a child who gets to go to a nice, heated in the winter, air-conditioned in the summer, or let's just say open window in the summer, I don't know how many <laughs> of them have got air conditioning, in Toronto or Hamilton or Mississauga or Ottawa compared to somebody who's getting their education under a tree? Well, uh, a child emerging from your schools will have uh, choices in life about what they want to do, how they want to work, where they want to live. They'll be able to navigate this global community, this interconnected world. Uh, if you emerge from a classroom of 100, uh, if you don't even get to finish primary school and millions of kids don't get to go to school at all, you won't become literate, you won't become numerate and that will mean your life is one of poverty. Uh, we know particularly for girls that if they get to go to secondary school, uh, they are more likely to marry later rather than be forced into an early marriage. They'll have fewer children, uh, they'll economically support themselves and their children and their community. Their kids are more likely to be vaccinated, more likely to survive infanthood, more likely to go to school themselves. So we get on this virtuous circle of development where circumstances are better not only for today's generation but the generations to come. Uh, I know people like you madam former prime minister and you're not motivated to make a billion dollars you're motivated to change the world you're different kinds of you're, you guys are different kind of cats so i know for you it's about impact how do you know if you're having impact in the face of 
the huge challenge that you've undertaken. Uh, if I was motivated to make a billion dollars, I'd be going quite badly at that. <laughs> uh, but on education, we do know country by country, we can point to uh, more students enrolled, more students actually learning, uh, more students with the prospect of going on to secondary school. Um, when I can go to a school in Malawi and know that if I go back in 12 months' time, it will look different. The children will have more resources at their disposal. If we can do that in one school, then we can do it in every school. If we've got enough global support uh, and that's where our great friends like Canada come in. Let's just uh, finish up here in our last couple of minutes on Australia and Canada and the relationship there. Uh, the Economist magazine apparently described Canadians as quote the last liberals that we have a national creed of tolerance and I have heard it said that Canada is sort of um, in light of the immigration refugee issues in the United States and Brexit in the UK sort of the last liberal democracy standing in the world today. Should Australia be included in that club as well? I think Australia is a wonderful, peaceful, multicultural society. We uh, value diversity. We have, um, you know, a strong sense of what it is to be Australian, to be uh, united around concepts like a fair go and looking after each other, concepts of mateship. Uh, but, you know, people have come to Australia from all around the world and made their way. I myself, you know, I was born in the United Kingdom and got to be Australia's Prime Minister. So I hope uh, that there are some more things uh, that the the economist or others could say are common between Australia and Canada. Uh, we're both Commonwealth countries, we're both part of the Five Eyes, that uh, international security outfit. Beyond that, um, what do we learn from each other, do you think? Well, I think one of the things we learn from each other, and I used to see this when I was in politics in Parliament, uh, is we both have national governments and strong provincial governments, we would say state governments. Uh, and that does give you some advantages. It can also give you some problems of duplication and, you know, fighting and disharmony between different levels of governments. That's our way. And, <laughs> well, and uh, there'd be lots of state premiers uh, who, if they were sitting here, would say that's the Australian way too. Uh, so I think we've got a lot to learn from each other about how to make those structures of government as effective and as efficient as they can be. Coming up on the agenda in the summer. Does America's unique dominance in the world today disturb you? Well, what I'm concerned about is not that there is a leader in the world. Indeed, it is a leader in the world on many scores. What I am concerned about is how America will use this unique position. If America were to try, and I think that it did try to impose its vision of the world, its uh, order, its standards, well, that will not happen. That's coming up on the Agenda in the Summer. And that's it for tonight's Agenda in the Summer. Tomorrow, we'll hear from writer Margaret Atwood, whose take on many things has informed our understanding of the world. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. And we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.